Hi everyone, welcome to the lecture presentation on children with special health care needs part 3. This is the concluding lecture on children with special health care needs. I am Dr. Fawaz Siddiqui from Department of Pediatric Dentistry and in this lecture we are going to learn about craniofacial malformations and syndromes as related to children. Our learning objective for today is to be able to recognize most frequently seen craniofacial malformations in children of Malaysia and also discuss the etiology and role of a pediatric dentist in the management of cleft lip and cleft palate. So let's begin with the first part of the presentation where we will try to learn about the common craniofacial malformations and syndromes. The first one is stretcher collin syndrome. It is also called as mandibulofacial dystosis. The characteristic features are of or is facial. Okay, and the first one is underdeveloped or absent zygomatic process or the mylar process of the cheek so you see this depression here this is very characteristic of the patients who have stretcher collins syndrome so this is very typical the absence of mylar process of the cheek you can see on the picture then you have downward slanting palpable fissures you see this palpable fissure is the eye opening so this is downward sloping towards the outside downward sloping and then you have underdeveloped mandible with macrognathia, pharyngeal hypoplasia and due to this underdeveloped mandible and pharyngeal hypoplasia these children have difficulty in breathing and in feeding and they also have corneal stenosis or atresia that means the development of the uh, inner anatomy of the nose and then they also have conductive hearing loss. So this is the treacher collins syndrome. You should be able to at least recognize a suspected case of treacher collins syndrome. And then of course, your job is to recognize and do the proper referral. Let's see another one. Hemifacial microsomia. Okay, now this is asymmetric unilateral craniofacial malformation and it is characterized by macrostomia, ear tags and epibular dermoids. So here we can see <coughs> the ear tags, very characteristic. They come in a different features of severity, right? And epibulbular dermoids are the tumors of the eyes. So here also from the ear tags, you can identify that something is happening and as the name says hemifacial so it is a unilateral uh, craniofacial deformity then we have hemifacial atrophy all right it is also called as Perry romberg syndrome and the characteristic features are atrophia of various tissues of one side of the face when you say various tissues it includes everything from epidermis and fat and muscles, everything, everything. So you see in the picture here, this is a progressive hemifacial atrophy. So this part of the face, which is again unilateral uh, deformity, this goes progressively atrophy is seen on one part of the face, right? So this side is a normal face. This part is getting hemifacial atrophy. So this is also a progressive disease. So uh, it continues on and then by the age of 20, it stabilizes. Along with the atrophy, the uh, child can also have uh, eye problems. That means the eyes are buried into the socket because of the atrophy of the ocular muscles. And then the patient can also have neurological complications like trigeminal neuralgia and hyperpigmentation of the skin. It's quite evident the girl has hyperpigmentation of the skin around the atrophied area. So this is hemifacial atrophy. Then you have hemifacial hypertrophy. Hemifacial hypertrophy again asymmetrical unilateral deformity in which the part affected of the face shows hypertrophy 
and when we say hypertrophy we are talking about all the tissues on that part of the face if you see in the picture here this boy has the hemifacial atrophy of the right side so you see all the fat tissues the skin the muscles are all hypertrophied as compared to the other side then in the intraoral you see this part of the tongue is hypertrophied this part of the tongue is normal and also you can see the teeth are also of the larger size if you see the molar here as compared to the contralateral side so this again is hemifacial hypertrophy hypertrophy of unilateral uh, face then we have apert syndrome this is a genetic syndrome and it is characterized by a multiple things like craniosynostosis synostosis and this means that the during the development of the skull we have some soft fontanelles in the skull which accommodate the growing brain and as the brain goes these fontanelles help in the expansion of the cranium but in this syndrome the fontanelles they unite and they close early and when the brain is growing it's trying to push its way out and then you have this abnormal shape of the cranium along with that you have mid facial hypoplasia and you can also have cleft palate intraorally along with this you can have symmetrical syndactyly of hands and feet that means the fingers are joined together and you can also have x ophthalmus which is very evident in this particular child the eyeballs is protruding out and again you have down slanting palpebral fissures strabismus and ocular proptosis so it is quite evident in this particular girl here with this you also have hearing loss and recurrent ear infection basically because the development of this part of the auditory canal is all affected because of the closure premature closure of the fontanel and one of the lesser severe forms is also called as crozon syndrome of course they all syndromes they share similarities the only mild differences next we have uh, peri robin syndrome again this is a chromosomal defect and this is characterized by macrogonathia uh, glossoptosis that is the tongue is retracted at the back of the uh, pharynx and you have cleft palate it's quite evident here in the picture the child has cleft palate and because of this they will have difficulty in breathing and eating if you see here the mandible is uh, hypoplastic leading to the condition of uh, microgonathia so this is pier robin syndrome so you should be able to um, at least identify with certain amount of uh, confidence if you come across one of these children and make appropriate referral to the physician then we have the cleft lip and the cleft palate and this is considered as the most common craniofacial anomaly and the global incidence is from 0.28 to 3 point or say 4 uh children per 1000 live births will have cleft lip and cleft palate and together if cleft lip and cleft palate if they occur together they will um, account for 50% of all the cases and isolated cases of cleft lip or isolated cases of cleft palate account for 25% of the cases and uh, the cause is mostly genetically determined and we don't know exactly what causes it is it uh, teratogenic influences of alcohol or smoking so we are really not very sure on the uh, the cause of cleft lip and cleft palate you have the developmental process the frontonasal eminence the maxillary process which is the stomatium the oral cavity and then you have the mandibular process and then we also have the medial nasal process here the lateral nasal process and the nasal pit and then this is how they all develop and try to merge together so if you see in this picture here you have the maxillary uh, process which is merging with the lateral nasal process with the medial nasal process here right so if these maxillary and the medial nasal process are not able to merge together you will have this problem of cleft lip okay and if this happens bilaterally then you will have bilateral cleft lip in the cleft palate if you see here this is the primary palate the primary palate is part of your medial nasal process right so this is the primary palate or it's also called as premaxilla and it contains the maxillary incisor teeth so this comes from your 
medial nasal process and then you have the horizontal plate coming in from the maxillary process and then the nasal septum coming from the frontonasal process so all these when they all merge together you will have the normal palate but if any of these are not able to merge together you will have cleft palate right so you can have a unilateral cleft palate here if this part cannot merge or if this part cannot merge or if both cannot merge or if the horizontal processes of the maxilla cannot merge then you will have cleft so it is important for us to classify the different kinds of cleft lips and cleft palate which can be seen depending upon the non union of developmental processes so one of the most commonly used and the simplest to understand is the views classification of cleft lip of course there are more complex classification of cleft lips but for the sake of our understanding for easy diagnosis for easy communication or diagnosis views classification is uh, is uh, popularly used so let's see how views has classified cleft lips so you have class 1 which is a unilateral notching of the vermilion not extending into the lips if you see here there is a unilateral notching of the vermilion border so this is class 1 the class 2 is when it gets more severe which is unilateral notching of the vermilion border with the cleft extending into the lip right so here the lips is involved but not involving the floor of the nose so the floor of the nose is not involved here in this case right so this is class 2 class 3 is again unilateral clefting of the vermilion border of the lip extending in through the lip into the floor of the nose so this is class 3 and class 4 is when you have bilateral clefting of the lip whether it is an incomplete notching or whether it is a complete notching so in this case you can see both incomplete notching and a complete notching involving the full lip so this is class 4 so views has classified cleft lip class 1 2 3 and 4 and if you can very easily remember by remembering notching of a million border notching of lip notching of the floor of the nose unilateral and bilateral is class 4 our views has also classified cleft palate all right so again there are four classes from class 1 to class 4 so let's see class 1 only involves a soft palate so see here in this child this is a gum pad this is the hard palate and this is the soft palate so ideally you have the union of the soft palate till here okay with the single uvula but here in this case this is class 1 this is the uh, cleft of soft palate only then we have class 2 which involves soft palate and the hard palate but not the alveolar process so this is class 2 so soft palate plus hard palate so class 3 very easy to understand and remember soft palate hard palate and a unilateral involvement of the alveolar process right and then the class 4 is soft palate hard palate and bilateral involvement of the alveolar process and here the premaxillary portion is very very mobile because it is only attached by the soft tissue of the face so there is no support so this part is very very mobile we will see a few slides later how they look clinically so for us <coughs> remember we use classification of cleft lip and cleft palate so when it comes to the management of cleft lip and cleft palate okay Uh, there are different stages and there are different procedures done in the different stages so it is important for us to remember uh, for a child at what stage of management the child is in and what procedures can be done so the first stage is your infant appliance stage so from birth to 18 months of age and in this stage there are a lot of things that needs to be done immediately so one of them is intraoral maxillary obturators pre surgery maxillary orthopedics kyloplasty which is a lip surgery pre surgery maxillary orthopedics then you have primary alveolar cleft bone grafting that is the grafting of the bone in the cleft area then you have palatoplasty which is a repair of the palate cleft palate and of course the dental care all right and uh, the second stage is the primary dentition so 18 months to 5 years so this is your stage of primary dentition which more only more looks towards maintaining of good oral hygiene and then you have mixed dentition stage from 6 to 
and here is where you do your secondary alveolar cleft bone grafting so here again this is a second procedure surgical procedure where you do bone grafting in the cleft area and then the dental care which continues and the last one is the permanent dentition stage which lasts from 12 to 18 years where you have to take care of the oral hygiene and then the patient can undergo orthognathic and cosmetic surgery to correct the defect of cleft palate or cleft lip. So now let's look at uh, these stages individually. So stage one, that is the infant appliance stage. So you have something called as intraoral maxillary obturator. And this is something that you need to fabricate as soon as the child is born, particularly within two weeks of birth. And the reason why you have to do this is because in cleft lip, cleft palate, the child, there is a communication between the oral cavity and the nasal cavity. So every time the child wants to drink milk, right, he aspirates it because a soft palate cannot control the flow of the milk, right? And then the milk also comes out through the nose because the palate is not there, there's nasal regurgitation. And then the child also sucks in a lot of air during feeding, which gives him abdominal distension and this causes a problem of malnutrition in children. So there you will see the children are not gaining weight, which they are supposed to do uh, after birth. So this, uh, to overcome this problem, we have to fabricate something called as intraoral maxillary obturator or simply an obturator. So what is an obturator? It's, it is a prosthetic uh, appliance which provides a false palate against which the infant can suck reduces the incidence of feeding difficulties in the newborn and helps maintain adequate nutrition. Not only this, but it also helps uh, in cross arch stabilization and prevents arch collapse after a definitive chyloplasty, that is a surgical closure of the lips. We'll see this a little later when we talk about the surgery itself. And it also provides maxillary orthopedic molding of the cleft segments into approximation before primary alveolar cleft bone grafting can be done so don't worry about all these things uh, as we go through the uh, presentation you will uh, begin to understand why what this all means so for now just remember if it's an obturator which gives us a false palate it's a prosthetic appliance which gives a false palate to prevent uh, to help the child during uh, the feeding so when the child is able to feed properly is able to gain weight then only we can perform any kind of a surgery on the child Otherwise, the child is at risk of dying during the surgery because of low birth weight. So here in this slide, uh, I have tried to show you how the maxillary obturator is made. So here in the first picture, if you see, this is a child and this is the alginate impression has to be taken and this is a custom made tray, right? So you have to really make a custom tray using shellac base plate called core cure acrylic uh, so that uh, the plate covers the maxillary arch of the child so normally uh, pediatric dentistry department has a lot of sizes of these plates so you basically take these custom made plate check which size fits and then you can take a maxillary impression using alginate make sure the child is upright and bending forward to avoid any aspiration of the material so you can use alginate also, you can use rubber based silicon material also anything but ensure that nothing should go down the throat of the child and therefore emergency resuscitation equipment must be present when you are doing this procedure of impression taking so it's not to be taken very lightly. In this particular uh, picture you have the impression taken from the child and you can see this is the cleft part here which is the raised part and this is your the alveolar process so one alveolar process is here the other alveolar process is here right so what you do is you pour the cast in this picture you see a stone model is poured and then you have marking to delineate how the obturator and then you block out the undercuts and then you use cold cure acrylic to fabricate a, a plate which looks something like this right so you this part is the elevation which was here so this part is where the depression is. So this is where the uh, plate has an elevation. And then when this plate is put into the child's mouth, it looks something like this. So see the uh, palate is closed, right? And this is the vertical extension into the nose. 
so normally nothing happens to the plate because the plate is fitting on the alveolar ridge so there is no chance of uh, the plate slipping down the throat of the child this is well fitted because of the impression uh, taken and the child can continue feeding till the time he can gain weight and we can do uh, some kind of surgery remember we talked about uh, surgical repair of the lip the chyloplasty and this repair of the lip is what we are talking about so this case is a child with a cleft palate along with cleft lip together so this is how you make an obturator so along with this obturator when the child is able to gain weight it is time for uh, pre surgery maxillary orthopedics okay so pre surgery maxillary orthopedics uh, the objective is to reduce the severity of the cleft deformity approximate the alveolar and the lip segments and decrease the nasal base width and elongate the columella achieve symmetry of the nasal cartilage so if you see here in this particular child you have this um, uh, unilateral uh, actually bilateral cleft palate and cleft lip okay class 4 lip and class 4 palate and you see this part of the premaxilla remember we talked about the one that is mobile and this one is mobile and to one side of the face so what this pre surgery maxillary orthopedics does is this tries to bring this segment of the maxilla which is called as a lesser segment towards the midline okay so this if you try to get this segment using orthopedic force towards the center this cleft width will reduce in size all right so this is one objective to reduce this uh, uh, the cleft segment the width then the width uh, decrease the nasal width also so if you see the nasal width is also more on this side less on this side so this when you try to bring this lesser segment of the maxilla towards the center you try to close this cleft as much as possible so that we can do a uh, surgical repair of the lip so if you try to repair the lip here okay so what repairing of the lip does is you take this portion of the lip here you take this portion of the lip here and then you stretch it and then you suture it in the uh, uh, suture it together so this you cannot do because the tissue is so less the soft tissue is so less so you really cannot stretch the lip so much so what you have to do is you have to try to get things as close as to the normal so that the cleft reduces the soft tissue grows and then we can close the lip so this is what is pre maxillary orthopedics so pre maxillary orthopedics requires a special kind of obturator and the procedure is called as naso alveolar molding very commonly used naso alveolar molding so again in the picture if you see here this child has got the pre maxilla deviated to one side with a big cleft here and surgery is out of question you cannot do any surgery unless you get this portion back into Uh, its original place as much as possible so you have this uh, appliance all right with this is called as the nasal extension and when the child is, is, is constructed similar to your uh, obturators how you construct your obturators but only the thing is here that uh, this portion of the appliance will exert force on the pre maxilla and try to bring it towards the center right so how you do it is through this elastic uh, tapes which is available by 3m it does not cause any harm to the child so if you see this appliance is fitted into the patient's mouth right and you see this tape is uh, put on the child's face quite tightly so you see here is wrinkle on the skin right so this is how uh, the tape is exerting the force on the premaxilla to bring it into the portion while the nasal extension is trying to increase the length of the columella that is the nose right and trying to get the things as close as to normal so here if you see in the cast here so you have this pre maxilla which is quite hanging out of the question this is the lesser segment these are called as the larger segments and you see this cleft here and this cleft here so once you do your nasal alveolar molding you can see the pre maxilla has uh, come back and this part of the cleft has reduced in width and this part of the cleft still is remaining so more or less we have achieved uh, nasal alveolar molding or pre surgical orthopedic uh, stage so now it will be easier for us to do any kind of lip repair so this is naso alveolar molding <clears throat> <clears throat> so once you have got the pre maxilla and you have tried to close the cleft as much as possible uh, we can do 
uh, surgical repair of the cleft lip. Now this is important because most of the time uh, the parents are quite uh, upset because of the child's appearance and if you perform a lip surgery which is done normally by the age of uh, three months the lip is repaired and the parents gain some confidence uh, and they begin to accept the child because now the child is looking more normal otherwise they are quite apprehensive as to what has happened to the child and what will the child have his life like so this is a very important step the surgical repair of the lips and when you're doing the surgical repair of the lips you also do primary nasal reconstruction uh, construction uh, together with the lip repairs you try to get the lip together so in this case that i have uh, picked up from the literature it does not have a nasal cleft uh, involving the floor of the nose and uh, the surgeons here have tried to close the lip using an overlapping method for these two cases and interdigitation method uh, for the child so this is how they perform the surgery uh, taking this side and taking this side and then stretching them and then closing it together so when you close this lip this lip kinds of uh, puts a pressure on the uh, premaxilla which was protruding out once upon a time so it's still protruded out so closure of this lip also causes pressure on the premaxilla to uh, retrude back but if the premaxilla is extruded too much and you try to close the lip over that extruded part what will happen is something called as lip dehiscence where the sutures will open up and will have failure of the surgical repair. So it is very important that you uh, perform premaxillary orthopedics before you do the lip repair. Okay. So now after you've done the lip repair, <clears throat> you go ahead and do post-surgery maxillary orthopedics. Right. The same thing, like I've shown you in the picture here, you have this cleft so much. Right. So again, you have to put in an obturator. And do nasoalveolar molding further to reduce this cleft by applying pressure through the uh, uh, nasoalveolar molding. Okay, so this will uh, also protect the maxilla because if you, uh, like I told you before, the lip will be causing uh, will be causing a tension here, which will be causing the premaxilla or this part of the maxilla to move back. And this tension, this force may cause the this larger segment and this larger segment to come together in a horizontal uh, axis, whereby you will have a problem called as maxillary collapse. And we don't want a maxillary collapse. We want to maintain the maxillary arch width so that it can accommodate all the teeth that the child will have during his primary dentition. So to avoid that, we have to do post maxillary uh, post surgery maxillary orthopedics so we have to put an obturator which can cause some kind of force not only to close this gap here but also to maintain this arch as much as possible which is called as cross arch stability and uh, once you do this post surgery maxillary orthopedics then you will have a very good close approximation of the uh, lesser and the larger segment of the maxilla so if you can see all these green dots are more or now more or less now aligned together so once this alignment has taken place you will understand that the width of the cleft has reduced tremendously right first from the pre-maxillary orthopedics then from the post -max, uh, post surgical maxillary orthopedics the cleft reduces in width quite a bit and this is a time where some of the surgeons uh, prefer to do an alveolar bone graft into the cleft to get the continuity of the maxillary arch but again people have said if you try to um, uh, do too much surgery in the mid facial region there may be chances that uh, there will be an attenuation of the mid facial growth that means the growth may stop because mid face is considered as one of the growth centers of the face so some of the authors uh, surgeons they don't prefer to do any surgery uh, with alveolar uh, crest bone grafting in this particular stage uh, some alternative repair techniques have already uh, are also there in the literature something called as gingivo periosteoplasty and uh, then if not anything you can just use post surgical maxillary orthopedics uh, to bring the lesser segment of the maxilla and the larger segment of the maxilla as close as possible till the time you can do a 
palatoplasty. So palatoplasty is the surgical repair of the cleft palate. So what happens in palatoplasty is basically you close the palate and this you can do by the age of one year and that is why everything is coming in stage one and once you repair the palate you basically close the communication between the nasal and the oral cavity and once this is closed uh, the child can control his uh, speech speech is basically when you uh, speak out the soft palate and the palate controls the air that is coming out through the nose and through the mouth and that is how you have speech so this is uh, palatoplasty facilitates the acquisition of normal speech and if you see it has to be done by the age of one year because that is the time the children start to develop speech so if you delay this too much the child will not develop normal speech and then he will have uh, faulty speech which will require a lot of time to correct so not only speech but this also improves the hearing and swallowing by aligning the cleft uh, uh, the palatal cleft musculature right so the child will start gaining control over the muscles of the palate the soft palate and uh, once this is done the speech therapy is required and it is very critical for the children to develop normal speech and there are a lot of different techniques available to close the palate here i have shown in the picture is you have the soft palate and the hard palate and you take the incision free some tissues so that you can pull the tissue together and form a suture so this part heals by secondary intention this part heals by primary intention so a lot of techniques here i've listed out some of the techniques uh, that uh, have been used by the different surgeons around the world and if you are lucky maybe you can have your own technique if you try to do your fellowship in uh, cleft palate and cleft lip uh, surgery so during all this it is very important to take care of the oral health right so here in the chart if you can see i have uh, taken a, a clip from a book which uh, clearly outlines uh, caries risk factors in children with uh, orofacial clefting so caries risk factors and periodontitis risk factors so these children have a lot of risk factors which can be detrimental for the uh, oral health of the child and if we are not able to keep the teeth healthy then there's no point doing so much surgery and if the child cannot have a normal teeth so it is very important for us to maintain the oral health of the child so you establish dental home by age one okay this part is covered in your preventive dentistry part one uh, where we talked about the dental home so we have to establish dental home and do all the things that has to be done in a dental home and the focus is on the prevention and monitoring of developmental issues okay so just uh, list out a few things the so caries risk factors is uh, these children have uh, enamel defects and these uh, children have parents who have so much surgery done so much medical attention that they give very low priority to the oral health okay and these children have this acrylic obturator which makes it the uh, cleaning of the obturator important then these children have a longer oral clearance time that means what they eat they take a lot of time to swallow it because they have difficulty in chewing and of course in the feeding and uh, then you can have, you can have food retention around the cleft areas okay and if you the children have teeth then the teeth will get carious immediately you will have a permissive parents uh, because the child is suffering from a deformity they will be very permissive and they will allow the child to have carogenic diet and then they will be less than adequate oral hygiene home care and then you have these orthopedic appliances uh, we talked about nasoalveolar molding we talked about uh, post surgery maxillary orthopedics so these all appliances will be a, a place where streptococcus mutans can collinate so again this puts the patient at high risk of caries then we have significant lip scarring and malalignment of the teeth which makes uh, the cleft area more difficult to clean and because of the deformity the parents will have aversion or fear of brushing their child's tooth because they're so worried and they don't want to touch that area and then the child may also have cognitive or motor impairment if the syndrome is associated with another syndrome which may lead to an ineffective oral hygiene so all this will put child to add developing caries the periodontal risk is a poorly developed osseous support and lack of proper connective uh, tissue attachment of the teeth 
associated with the cleft so they basically when i say cleft there is no bone there so any teeth that is erupting at the side of this cleft will be have very poor osseous support and periodontal ligament support so there is chance of premature expulsion of these teeth then the teeth may have abnormalities of the size shape number and malalignment and all this will cause the difficulty in uh, maintaining oral hygiene and removal of uh, plaque which can lead to gingivitis and periodontitis of course inadequate oral hygiene like we discussed on this part of the uh, table and then the child will have orthodontic appliances and they will have subgingival restorations and there will be a discontinuous and infrequent uh, periodontal maintenance basically because it is not a priority for the child the priority is getting the facial deformity corrected that is the first priority of parents and the surgeons so for us we need to take good care of these children so that they don't get caries they don't get gingivitis so now we come to the stage 2 stage 2 is remember we are in the primary dentition uh, stage and in this stage we basically focus on maintaining the oral health so we don't do any surgery in this stage we just monitor the oral health when the teeth come out make sure the parents understand the importance of oral hygiene you have to teach the parent how to maintain oral hygiene reduce the possibility of uh, development of dental caries there will be lot of uh, teeth which will be erupting ectopically because of the cleft so you need to be aware that you will have ectopic eruption uh, but you don't do anything to correct that ectopic eruption in this particular stage and then you need to have periodical uh, periodic uh, periodic recall every 3 to 4 months remember for high caries risk patient we need to call the patient every 3 to 6 months so we have to call these patients every 3 to 6 months 3 to 4 months for topical fluoride application and to check on the patient that they are maintaining good oral hygiene and then of course the in office fluoride application is very very important then we have stage 3 stage 3 is in the mixed dentition stage and it is here that you do your secondary alveolar cleft bone graft so if you see in the picture here this child has this cleft here all right so this cleft here means there is no bone there is only soft tissue here so in this stage you can do bone grafting in this particular cleft area and this gives us a lot of advantages like uh, Uh, it can provide bony support for the teeth adjacent to the cleft so these teeth can have some bony support so less chances of this teeth exfoliating uh, prematurely or getting um, loose prematurely or premature loss of these teeth because of lack of bony support then you have uh, then the this procedure provides bone through which the teeth can erupt so remember the canine is high up here and if there is no bone the canine cannot erupt okay so to erupt the canine needs the bone so if you put in a bone graft here the chances that the canine will erupt is high then you provide maxillary arch continuity and you can also close any oral or nasal fistula that is still remaining after palato plasty that we did in the stage 1 and of course this uh, the bone if you put bone here it is going to give a support to the base of the nose right so the base of the nose which is sunken in Uh, you know, clinically may have support from the uh, bone grafting and then they may look more normal so these are the objectives of or the advantages of the bone graft if you do it in this particular stage and uh, this is best performed between the ages of 9 and 12 years of age particularly when the canine root is uh, one quarter to half formed and that is when it is starting to you know show um Uh, some movement in the alveolar bone before that movement starts. So the movement actually eruption starts when the three fourth root is formed or uh, two third root is formed. So before that, you have to put in the bones so that the canine can erupt. So you have to basically do this before the canine starts eruption. So once you put in the uh, bone, you have to wait for two months for the healing process, and only after that you can do orthodontic movement, tooth movement. remember we talked about these children may have ectopic eruption of the teeth so if they have we can now do the orthodontic teeth movement or interoceptive orthodontics so in the dental care we uh, have to perform interoceptive orthodontic treatment for the correction of ectopically erupting permanent central and lateral incisors and uh, we have to uh, 
correct the cross bites of the posterior dental segment remember we talked about that if you don't support the larger segment alveolar process and there may be a collapse of the maxillary arch so if you have this collapse this is a time when you start to expand when it expand is this is a good time because you have already put your bone graft into the cleft area so if you have not done bone grafting in the primary uh, stage this is the time if you do you have much better results so now the bone is in place the healing has taken place and now you can do maxillary expansion the bone will expand and then you have this uh, rapid maxillary expansion plate you can use you can use your uh, uh, coffin spring anything which uh, can do maxillary expansion and then also because of these rotation of the maxillary you may have uh, traumatic occlusion on the mandibular incisors like stripping of the gingiva okay or mobility of the lower incisors so it's very important that we perform interceptive orthodontic correction of all this so maxillary expansion is done in the posterior segment and once this condition is corrected we can put in a holly's appliance for retention of whatever tooth movement we have achieved so this is the dental care that we have to provide in stage 3 also with the interceptive orthotics it is very important that during this stage the child will start to go to school and um, they he may feel uncomfortable with his appearance and he may be a uh, uh, victim of uh, bully, uh, uh, bullies in the school so it is very important to provide this psycho social uh, support so how do you do that is you can provide an interim prosthesis to improve facial appearance so if you see here this is the prosthesis that has been provided for the child who does not have any anterior teeth so if you see here this is the, how the prosthesis will look this is the extension and the prosthesis so this will give some kind of will give some uh, psychological support and confidence for the child to attend school and to mix with friends so very important and then you have to periodically adjust this prosthesis to adjust for the developing dentition so when the premolars or canines start to erupt maybe you have to change the design of the prosthesis and things like that and in this stage you can also do a revisional surgery of the lip and the nose so initially if the deformity of the lip or the nose was too great to be corrected in one surgery this is the time you can perform another surgery to uh, correct the lips or the reconstruct the nose this uh, is uh, when the child uh, comes to the stage 4 so let's see what we do in the stage 4 so stage 4 is uh, when the child is having his permanent dentition and this is the time when you do your orthognathic surgery and cosmetic surgery so orthognathic surgery we will do for the maxilla or the mandible whichever but the important thing to remember is that before you do this surgery the child must have attained his full growth of the jaws right and then all permanent teeth should have erupted except the third molars and this will signify the child has reached his growth and that is the time you want to do orthognathic surgery so if you remember from your uh, orthodontics if you do orthodontic surgery and the growth potential is still there the deformity will come back or the deformity will become more severe so you have to wait for the growth to be completed so tentatively the boys uh, the growth is complete by 17 to 18 years of age uh, 18 years of age and for the girls the growth is almost complete after 15 years of age remember the boys have two years of more growth spurts than girls remember from development of uh, development and eruption we discussed this and then you can perform the leafwort osteotomies to get the orthognathic surgery basically the maxilla is uh, underdeveloped because of the clefting so you can do these surgeries to correct the retrognathic mandible uh, retrognathic maxilla so along with that orthognathic surgery you also have to do cosmetic surgery that means uh, you can do nasal bone surgery to restore the projection the symmetry you can refine and uh, the nose itself which can improve air flow through the nose uh, very much you can also correct the cartilaginous nasal tip right so if it is deviated to one side you can have a surgery to correct the deviation of the cartilage cartilaginous uh, part of the nose and it's a common deformity uh, secondary deformity uh, repaired unilaterally and then of course last this is the last time you can do a lip surgery to correct too short a lip too long a lip or a very tight upper lip 
and then you can also correct any deficiency of the vermilion tissues of the lip or any residual notching of the lip so this is your last lip surgery that you should do for this child and this will complete his stage four so this is uh, where the stages of management of the teeth so now let's look at in particular uh, children with cleft lip and cleft palate have a higher incidence of certain dental abnormalities so what are those abnormalities they have higher incidence of natal or a neonatal maxillary central incisor you see here this is a newborn child with a, a neonatal maxillary incisor teeth right here so it's very common then you can have congenitally absent primary and permanent lateral incisor because of the clefting it is possible that the the tooth germ is not there at all so the congenital absent tooth then you can have congenitally missing second premolars also and then you can have supernumerary because of the clefting the tooth germ may divide into two or three germs and then if you can see here you can have supernumerary teeth especially in the part where the premaxilla and the horizontal plate of the maxilla they join up there so you can have a lot of supernumerary teeth and of course you can have ectopic eruption of primary lateral incisors and the permanent canines palatally because these are the teeth that will fall in the cleft area so depending on how the bone is growing how the cleft is closed you can have this ectopic eruption along with this you will have uh, enamel hypoplasia microdontia or macrodontia fused teeth abrasions of the crown shape of the primary and the permanent maxillary incisor so this is basically because all tooth germs in this particular area will be affected you will have premature loss of teeth in the cleft areas like i told you before because there is no bony support there is no periodontal ligament support this teeth may these teeth may become loose and fall off prematurely so this could be your primary incisors primary uh, permanent lateral incisors all those teeth then you can have collapse of the maxillary posterior segment with posterior cross bite remember we talked about collapse of the maxillary segment so you can have posterior cross bite so these children have posterior cross bite as well then trauma from occlusion uh, to the mandible incisor because the maxillary incisors are ectopically erupted and rotated and then they will be causing abnormal forces on the mandible incisors and the mandible incisors will show signs of trauma from occlusion then you can have traumatic anterior end to end occlusion or an anterior cross bite and you can also have a convex lateral facial profile so if you see in the picture here the development of the maxilla is severely affected so the child can have a convex profile so these are some of the things which are more commonly seen in a child with cleft lip and cleft palate which we should be aware of so what is uh, the role of pediatric dentist in all this all right so as you have already seen during the management we had these dental phases right so if if uh, we try to summarize this is what uh, we will get so we have to ensure two things one is the preventive dental care going so you have to use fluoride supplements dentifrices and the mouth rinses depending on the caries risk of the child you have to ensure the child maintains good proper dental hygiene maybe you want to instruct the patients instruct the child the different brushing techniques that has to be used the modified brushes that you have to use all this you have to take into consideration and then you have to maintain the continuity of care necessary during the extended treatment so if you see from the management which starts right after birth and ends in the child when the child is about 18 years old stage 4 right with his cosmetic surgeries and orthodontic surgery so your care has to continue uh, preventive care has to continue all through uh, not only preventive care if the child has needs some uh, operative care restorative care prosthetic care all this must be done remember we talked about psychosocial support where you have to give a process to the patient so that he can feel more confident in at school so all that also in comes as a role of pediatric dentist and of course uh, the pediatric dentist is also responsible to uh, perform the pre-surgical and post-surgical treatment phases of uh, maxillary orthopedics by fabricating obturators and by fabricating uh, and by performing nasoalveolar molding of course this sometimes overlaps with the uh, functions of an orthodontist uh, but the more or less the pediatric dentistry is the one who is coordinating all this treatment so if uh, you're thinking that uh, the management of cleft lip and cleft palate is very let me tell you about the T 
team members who uh, contribute towards the correction of this craniofacial uh, deformity and craniofacial syndrome. So I have uh, listed out in the next three slides all the specialities that uh, take part in the management of the child. So uh, to begin with, you have these uh, craniofacial surgeons. So these are surgeons, plastic and reconstructive surgeons, and they are the team leaders and they are the ones who make the call of all the surgeries that is going to happen because basically they are very well trained in recognizing distortion of craniofacial region so you have this fellowship going on in the western countries as an oral maxillofacial surgeon also you can become a craniofacial surgeon and of course the ms surgeons also can become just quite open then you have pediatric neurosurgeons you have pediatric neuro audiologist right then you have pediatric anesthesiologist then you have neuro ophthalmologist and then you have auto laryngo just that is let me take care of the eye the nerve the anesthesia the eye, you know uh, and these guys provide all the support that the craniofacial surgeon needs and all the assessments that the child has to undergo from his uh, neural development uh, from his uh, diagnosis of the deformity, from giving anesthesia, because these children are very young and the uh, craniofacial surgeon has to operate and uh, perform lip surgeries and palate uh, uh, surgeries as soon as the child is still two years old. Uh, two years old. Uh, so this is quite, quite uh, difficult. So quite challenging anesthesiologist has, um, it's quite a challenging job for um, pediatric anesthesiologists. And then you have uh, ophthalmologists, and ENT surgeons just to ensure that there is no other problem the child is facing, especially during uh, anesthesia. Then you have your speech pathologist, then you have your pediatric medicine or uh, genetist. And these are the people who determine whether the patient's problem fit into a known syndrome or if genetic counseling is required for the patient, uh, for the parent. So that, you know, if the siblings will also have the same condition, so you give your blood test and then you have this uh, uh, genotyping of the patient and then they try to figure out uh, what kind of syndrome is there or you know, what kind of chromosomal abnormality is there. So this is quite important. Then you have psychologists and they evaluate the patient's intellectual potential, academic achievement and they provide psychological preparation for the surgery, not only for the patient but also for the parents. So these are a very important part of the team. Then you have the social workers and this social worker is basically the person who meets up with the parents uh, to obtain the family history and assess coping abilities and expectations and provide referral for community resources and basically you know support the family and the patient through the difficult times of all those surgeries uh, by being there for them and then you have your anthropologist and these are the guys who help in planning the surgery by identifying the area and degree of the defect by using measurements of the head and face of the patient and then comparing it to a normal patient and then they can advise that how much defect is there like how many centimeters or how many millimeters correction is required and after surgery they try to follow the growth pattern and try to aid the craniofacial surgeon if something is going uh, out of hand then you have a medical artist and these are the guys who use photography uh, photography and data from the anthropologist to draw a patient's ideal face and this drawing provides a visual model for the surgical team to work with. So how the patient should look in the end, beyond the surgeon should know in the start so they can they adjust their surgeries. Then you have the photographer. Photographer is the one who takes all the pictures and which is very important for treatment planning and research. And then you have craniofacial nurse coordinator. These are the special uh, trained nurses who uh, provide uh, education in the preparation for the surgery for the parents and serve as a patient family resource as well as uh, uh, coordinate the treatment with all other specialties as well. Then you have team secretaries. Basically, this is an admin job which are, who arranges clinical appointments and schedules and transportation and the lodging arrangements for the uh, families for when they come in for surgery or checkup. And then we have uh, us here, pediatric dentist. We provide the preventive care, educational, and therapeutic services related to oral hygiene. So basically, our domain is to protect the child from caries and from periodontal diseases. And then the orthodontist, who has to plan orthodontic treatment and surgical correction of the malocclusion, maybe orthognathic surgery, interceptive orthodontics, 
or uh, fixed orthodontics uh, when the child is old is all falls under the domain of orthodontics. So with this, I end my session uh, with the small information that in Malaysia, there is a cleft lip and a cleft palate association of Malaysia. Okay, and they are trying to work their way by uh, increasing the awareness of cleft lip and cleft palate. So if you are interested in the topic, maybe you want to get in touch with them and they are doing a lot of fundraising activities like fun run and fun activities and you can associate yourself um, with this association. One more uh, uh, book that I came across, I have not read it personally, but uh, I am reading quite a good reviews about this book written by uh, uh, Noura Abu Hassan and uh, she is a patient or she was a patient of cleft lip and cleft palate and in this book she has described her journey on how she has uh, dealt with her uh, situation of cleft lift and cleft palate okay so this book if you can get hold of this book uh, maybe you want to read this book and uh, they i'm sure there's a lot of uh, um, interesting insight into the lives of uh, people with cleft lift and cleft palate so uh, with this uh, i end my presentation and i end the series of uh, lectures on children with special healthcare needs we will be starting a Google Classroom and if you have any questions, you are most welcome to put it on the Google Classroom where we will also put in some uh, assessment questions for you for uh, assessing your knowledge and for your own self-assessment. So that is it from me uh, for now and I'll see you in our next class. Bye-bye.